They turned my room upside down, went through all my books, all my videotapes, what? all my private things, and they found nothing, nothing, nothing that can say Michael Jackson did this. Nothing. But let me ask you a couple day, of questions. To this day, nothing. Let, Still, nothing. Let me ask nothing, you a Nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> nothing. I got nothing. As you may or may not know, we have called everyone we can call. We have checked everything we can check. We have gone and tried to see if what we heard before is in fact the case. I want to ask you about two things. These reports that we read over and over again, that in your rooms they found photographs of young boys, not of young adults. Young boys, not children, all kind of girls and everything. Then that they found photographs, books, of young boys who were <coughs> undressed. No. Didn't happen. No, not that I know of, unless people sent me things that I haven't opened. People, sent, people know my love for children, so they send me books from all over the world, from South America, from Germany, from Italy, from Sweden. So if people have, say that, that they found those things, if there's an indication, let them come forward, let them produce them, right? Yeah, because I get all, I, I get all you, you wouldn't believe the amounts of mail that I get. And if you say to somebody, you know, if I let the fans know I love Charlie Chaplin, I'll be swarmed in Charlie Chaplin paraphernalia. One of the but if questions. I say I love children, which I do, they swarm me with everything pertaining to kids. Nine out of ten times, those who claim Michael Jackson is a paedophile will have allegations of disturbing child porn that was supposedly uncovered during the 1993 and 2003 raids of Neverland. These same allegations arose again in the media in June of 2016, as if they had unearthed new documents. The problem is that the police documents in question and the list of items seized from Neverland were not new or recently unearthed documents as some media outlets have mistakenly claimed in an effort to bolster salacious headlines. These were all items that were entered in court back in 2005 items that were well known to both prosecution and defence and were presented before both Judge Melville and the 12 members of the jury. None of the items seized from Neverland fit the legal definition of child pornography and in fact many of the items that were creating most of the media hysteria were not pornographic at all. What is usually used against Jackson as child porn are legal art books and art photography that have been found in Jackson's home. Most of these art books and magazines do not have children in them. They were legal art books, a few of them containing some examples of adult erotica. But again, these were not titles that could be in any way deemed as pornographic or even obscene. You should also realise that Jackson owned hundreds of thousands of books, many in storage, and Neverland's library alone contained over 10,000 books, many not even purchased by Jackson but sent to him as gifts. We will discuss the books that were mostly mentioned in the media and deemed twisted and disturbing. It is significant to mention that the mere possession of child pornography is a federal crime. Many states also have criminal statutes for the possession and distribution of child pornography. If the books had been pornographic in nature or substance, prosecution would have been inevitable. The books in this video are from a list of what was found at Neverland sometime in 2003, which evidently included some old pieces from the 1993 case. The list is 18 pages long and we will discuss what was deemed the worst of what was found among the tens of thousands of books in Michael Jackson's library. Let's start with three books that were confiscated during the house search in 1993. These are most used against Jackson as they included nude photographs of young boys. Often you will not find mentioned that at least one of these three books entitled The Boy, a photographic essay, judging from the inscription in it, was a gift Jackson received from a fan. The inscription read, 
to Michael from your fan, Rhonda, 1983, Chicago. There was no evidence that Jackson had ever opened this book. The other entitled Boys Will Be Boys had an inscription in it by Jackson himself, which shows he saw in those pictures it said, Look at the true spirit of happiness and joy in these boys' faces. This is the spirit of boyhood, a life I never had and will always dream of. This is the life I want for my children. MJ Since the two books are vintage books and sequels to each other, it is possible that they were both gifts from the same fan who inscribed one of them. They contain pictures of boys in various situations by different photographers including pictures taken during filming of the 1963 Lord of the Flies movie. They do include nude photographs of children, but the photographs are not pornographic or sexual. They show the children in various non-sexual activities like playing and swimming, etc. This is the third book that was confiscated in 1993 and contains both boys and girls mostly dressed but some nude or semi-nude. All three of these books are in the United States Library of Congress. The rest of the books we will discuss were taken during the 2003 raid. Underworld is a book about underwear by Kelly Klein, the ex-wife of Calvin Klein. Underworld is a collection of 154 photographs and celebrates the human body and encompasses more than 100 years of body photography. The book contains artistic photographs of people in underwear. Among them are the rock band The Red Hot Chili Peppers. For an even better understanding of the context of this book, here are some customer reviews. Very interesting and captivating look at underwear and body. Photographs taken by old masters of photography, new masters and amateur photographers make Underworld complete. Very sexy, innocent and liberating. A lovely book, safe on the most conservative coffee table and full of moments that generate emotions. Underworld is one of the collections of classic photography. Room to Play is a book with surrealistic photographs and or animations of children. The book is in the United States Library of Congress. Simon Johan creates surreal and narrative tableau of corrupted youth. His images of children and adolescents are constructed by digitally manipulating and combining parts of faces and bodies belonging to people of various ethnicities, ages and genders. My photographs are composites of multiple image fragments that I digitally manipulate and combine, including both images that I have photographed myself and found images. By combining different elements, my objective is to create artificial scenarios that appear vaguely familiar and produce numerous associations. I want to evoke a sense of familiarity that will seduce the viewer into allowing his or her own experience, imagination and understanding of existing popular imagery to become tools for interpreting my work. This book contains artistic photographs of two teenage boys in rural Louisiana. According to the prosecution, they confiscated it because in some of the photos the subjects were wearing a swim trunk type of clothing. The author is a renowned photographer who landed jobs in Los Angeles photographing celebrities and shooting album cover art, including one assignment for the debut album of then unknown singer Alanis Morissette. Drew and Jimmy is John Patrick Salisbury's first book and is the result of five years of reflection on his family's past. Hailing originally from an isolated farming village in Northern Carolina, Salisbury was preceded by seven generations. Family relations still live there and Salisbury relives his past vicariously in this book through the lives of his own cousins, Drew and Jimmy. 
What results is a poignant and moving portrait of boyhood in rural America. Visually pleasing as well as heartfelt sincerity. My family was not as deep rooted there as Salisbury's were, but I grew up there and those roots run just as deep. It was a truly wonderful place to grow up and the book depicts the environment beautifully. Beautiful and thoughtful, Salisbury has created a wonderful journal of growth and sensitivity. He has pulled at his heart to create this chronological of youth to adulthood, a somber passing it would seem for him. The fourth sex turns a critical, illustrated spotlight on adolescence. A territory of transition crisscrossed by the most varied creative energies. A series of iconographic materials begins in the 1960s and moves up to the present. Revealing clothes, behaviour patterns, novels and visual artworks created or inspired by the transnational tribe that are teenagers. The book's shifting political incorrect graphic styles give form and colour to all the contradictions and ambiguities of an unhappy age that we never cease to remember with nostalgia and the occasional twinge of pain. A great book by fashion provocateur Raph Simons that showcases a fine collection of cultural artefacts, from pop to the submersive. The book manages to remind me of my own days of adolescence and the images and iconography that inspired my sense of outrage, the shape of sexuality and the ideas that pumped the new lifeblood of my generation into our society. Odd but awesome book. An expressionistic piece of art, a book filled with a collaboration of photographs that show the feeling of being an adolescent and shows real life in action. A fun book to look at with friends. I promise you'll love it. The book appeared to be a compilation of numerous photographs depicting men, women and children of both sexes. The majority of the photographs depicted the subjects completely unclothed, including the male and female children. This type of material may be used as part of a grooming process facilitating the molestation of intended victims. In reality though, this book documents Pierre Formiguera's Chronos project in which he took subjects whose ages ranged from 2 to 75 at the project's beginning and photographed them once a month over a 10 year period. According to the police, this is a book consisting of a compilation of photographs of nude and or semi-nude women in sexually explicit poses. And that is exactly what it is. Women dressed in 19th century clothes in some explicit postures and shot by French photographer Alexandra Dupoy. The Camp Cove is a book with artistic, non-sexual photographs of adult men, including nude and semi-nude photographs in various settings both indoors and outdoors. The author is a children's book illustrator and gay art photographer who lives in Sydney, Australia. He is a renowned artist and has exhibited work around the world with exhibitions in Australia as well as Italy, France, Spain and Japan. He has received accolades for both his artistic and teaching ability, including both the TAF Award for Teaching Excellence and the NSW Department of Education and Training's Teacher of the Year Award in 1999. Dress Up is a collection of black and white photographs of children dressing up in various roles and settings. The author, Stara Kenga, won national acclaim for her first book on gardens. Earth on Her Hands, The American Woman in Her Garden, which received an American Horticultural Society Book Award for 1999. Her work has appeared in numerous national publications, including Horticulture and Country Home. She received her master's degree in photography from the Rhode Island School of Design and has been granted fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Massachusetts Artist Foundation. Her photographs have been exhibited in museums and galleries across the United States and abroad.
When he first started in commercial illustration, Dave Nestler's innate ability to capture likenesses got him plenty of assignments for film and television. Always a fan of the pinup and inspired by such greats as Vargas and Sayurama, Dave also created a series of stunning erotic portraits that got him attention of Playboy magazine. It wasn't long before he would star in gallery showings and command fine art prices for his illustrations. For those not quite ready to mortgage the house, here for the first time is a collection of these full colour masterworks for your own personal admiration. The Art of Dave Nessler is an oversized presentation, 48 pages in glorious full colour printed on heavyweight coated stock, every page worthy of a frame and a spotlight of its own. Original and flawless, wow! I don't even know where to begin because there are just so many elements to this book that I just love. I really cannot stress to you how valuable I think this work is. The fact that each strand of hair is done in acrylic is mind-blowing to me. Great book from a great artist. Wicked Intentions is one of the few books I own by Dave Nestler and is a must for the library, any pin-up art collector or tattoo artist or enthusiast of the female form. This is a must have for any fan of pin-up art. The police singled this book out as an indication of guilt due to the fetish nature of its content, such as bondage. This is a fantastic book, which I've owned for a long time now. It is one of the first books I obtained while starting out on the road of the fantasy art genre. Sorama is a master of the airbrush methods. His paintings are of an adult nature depicting women in bondage, characters restrained and of course, lifelike beautiful women. Sometimes I have to remind myself that I am not looking at a photo because the art is so lifelike. This book is for adults and the open-minded. An incredible completely original hardcore erotic art book by the master this is not a book for your coffee table. If you haven't heard of this guy, this is the place to start. Hajin's work also appeared among others on the cover of the 2001 album Just Plush Play by the rock band Aerosmith. Bidgood is a book about the life and work of American artist James Bidgood. The book includes nude or semi-nude artistic photos of men in various non-sexual fairy tale like settings. The book was published by publisher Benedict Tanshin, who specialises in art, photography and art history books. Jackson's attorney Thomas Mesero mentioned at the 2005 trial that Tanshin had sought to work with the Jackson family and that he sent this book to Jackson. There was more Tanshin publications among the confiscated books. Bidgood is a terrific introduction to the 66-year-old photographer's work. Although some may consider the style of the photos kitschy and campy, Bidgood argues through his work that beauty informs style and fashion. There aren't interchangeable twinks in satire costumes. These photographs harken back to an era when a different gay sensibility ruled. The informative and detailed accompanying essays help the reader understand what he's seeing and place Bidgood's work in a broader artistic, photographic and cultural context. Excellent. Tarmina is a collection of non-sexual artistic photos of males, many nude or semi-nude in the 1930s. The photos are from the late 1800s. For over a century, the art photographs of Wilhelm von Glauden have been admired and collected, maligned and banned, and have generally been a landmark in the study of male nude in art. This book is graced by a fan preface written by Ulrich Pohlmann, a terse essay which surveys the artist's life and makes a fine argument for the inclusion of von Glauden's photographs in the museums of the world. It is a joy to have this collection available in its entirety. An artistic photographic book about youth culture and neglected youth by the renowned photographer Ed Templeton. 
The police confiscated it because it includes some nudity and claim they were unable to determine with any accuracy if material within this book could be considered child pornography. Before the Hand of Man is a photographic essay capturing the beauty of nature and man. Untouched by civilization, it includes non-sexual artistic photos of nude men. The book is a rare vintage book published in the 1970s. It is in the United States Library of Congress. The book was published in 1972 and had one edition only. This book contains artistic photographs of children and young people in a beach setting in swimwear. The author, Rena Kuck Dijkstra, is a Dutch photographer who might be the most important photographer of portraits alive today. Her people emerge from beaches, hospital rooms, indefinable space to haunt us with their imperfect beauty and their fierce necessity of existence. These photographs heroize individuals in a brazen way. Rena Kuck Dijkstra has a gift for capturing the underlying humanity in her portrait subjects with a simplicity and innocence that is rare even among top photographers. Highly recommended for the serious student of photography. The police officer who confiscated it claimed that based on their training, this type of material can be used as part of a grooming process by which people, those seeking to molest children, are able to lower the inhibitions of their intended victims and facilitate the molestation of said victims. This is a book in which human armpits are photographed in a deceptive manner, as if they were female genitalia. Janet Williams, the police officer who confiscated the book, said on the stand at Jackson's trial that she was shocked by the content of this book. So, let's see the content which shocked this seasoned sex crime detective. This is what Poo Chi pictures look like. The photographs are inventive and quite amusing. According to the police, however, it could have been used for grooming. Naked as Jaybird is about the history of the American nudist magazine, Jaybird. This was published in the 1960s, described by the prosecution as nude adult male and female erotica, very graphic. The Glory of the Deans Women contains a series of photographs of nude women by Andre de Deans who, among others, famously photographed Marilyn Monroe. This book is filled with artistic photos of a young man by Bruce Weber. In most of the photos, the subject is clothed. Out of around 150 photos in the book, there are only about five to six nude photos. The book also includes photos of the subject with various celebrities like Pamela Anderson, and it has brief texts by artists and celebrities such as Bruce Springsteen. Weber is very much renowned for his uniquely stylish and elegant photography and worked on many ad campaigns for brands such as Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Revlon, Versace, as well as with magazines such as Vogue, GQ, Vanity Fair, Elle and Rolling Stone. Weber also directed music videos for artists like Chris Isaac and the Pet Shop Boys and he famously photographed many celebrities, among them Madonna, Brad Pitt, Bruce Springsteen, David Bowie and Michael Jackson. He first worked with Jackson in the 70s when Jackson was still a member of the Jackson 5, then again in 2007. Jackson's defence at his 2005 trial said that Weber sent this book to Jackson unsolicited. Bob and Rod is a compilation of non-sexual artistic photographs of two males who are mostly nude or semi-nude. 
The subjects are Bob Paris and Rod Jackson, who were one of the first famous gay married couple in the United States, appearing on many talk shows including Oprah Winfrey in the late 80s, early 90s. This book is in the United States Library of Congress. This book is exactly as the police described it as, a book about the history of pornography with heterosexual photos from the 1940s on to recent. Some graphic, some sadomasochism. This is a collection of artistic photography by Robert Maxwell. The book includes some nude and semi-nude photos. It was indicated by Jackson's defence at his trial in 2005 that Maxwell is a personal friend of the Jackson family. He is another photographer who has worked with a number of celebrities including Angelina Jolie, Yoko Ono, Natalie Portman and Johnny Depp. This book is also in the United States Library of Congress. A compilation of photographs, drawings, cartoons and writings about homosexuality activity between adult men. This book was particularly emphasised by the prosecution and was even brought up in their closing statement. Probably because it was the only publication in Jackson's possession which depicted male on male sexual activity. They suggested this vintage book, Rarity from the 1970s, that Jackson had in a cardboard box in the midst of hundreds of other art books and photography books, proved that the singer was homosexual. While dozens of heterosexual porn magazines that the singer possessed, bought on a regular basis and kept in places such as his nightstand were not an indication of his sexuality, according to the prosecution's theory at least. These books were not found in the context of an excessive collection of nude photographs of children, but they were found in the art book collection of a man who was generally interested in photography, art photography, art history, book rarities and vintage books. Jackson once bought an entire bookstore and probably had thousands of unread, unopened books, hence why so many were found in cardboard boxes. Besides his personal fascination with art photography, we can safely assume that his photo collections were used as inspiration in his own work. For styling and restyling his own photo shoots and music videos into something neoclassical, catchy, glamorous, sexy and visually irresistible. The proof for this can be found right in the police report. Just a couple of paragraphs earlier is a piece of evidence called item 1004, which describes them as seven photographs of unidentified males in their late teens or early twenties. The pictured individuals are light-skinned African Americans who were posed in a provocative manner and were wearing little or no clothing. The subjects' private areas were covered by what little clothing they were wearing or by cloth material purposely placed to cover the genitalia. The following phrase was written on the box containing the photographs. Why photo shoot? In addition, Michael Jackson was also photographed in the company of these individuals. Again, these individuals were posed in provocative manner with bare chests. It should be noted, says the police officer, I recognise the photograph described as being associated with the pop group 3T. I further learned that the pictured individuals were Michael Jackson's nephews. Although the photos contained in items 1003 through 1008 appear to be commercially produced, they do depict young males in a limited clothing and various provocative poses. This type of material can be used as part of a grooming process by which people seeking to molest children are able to lower the inhibitions of their intended victims and facilitate the molestation of said victims. I would advise the police officer against walking into a record store and taking a look at the album covers. They might have a heart attack when they see all of the grooming depicted on them. 
Also, the book Tyrmina clearly inspired Michael to include some antique scenes into his You Are Not Alone video with Lisa Marie Presley, as is clear from this picture. Besides the art books, the police also confiscated a whole lot of adult heterosexual porn magazines and videos, which we won't get into in this video. When we say barely legal, you probably get the idea. Also confiscated were vintage nudist periodicals. Described by the police as the official publication of International Nudist Conference, there were 19 copies of Nudist Sunshine and Health. The periodicals contain nude photographs of men, women and children, as well as writings pertaining to nudism. The photographs and writings did not appear to be pornographic in nature. Until into the 50s, the pictures were censored from nudity. The magazines were not sexual or pornographic in nature and thus couldn't be used for any grooming. But their purpose was to promote a healthy lifestyle and being at one with nature. As you know now, there was no child pornography ever found at Jackson's home. Not in 1993 and not in 2003. Note that the police officer repeats after each entry in his review. None of the books and magazines contained pictures that depicted illegal activities such as child pornography. The only actual porn in his nightstand was clearly legal, adult and heterosexual. Not something you would expect in the nightstand of a paedophile who likes young boys. So, were those books used for any other evil cause such as grooming? Well, Wade Robson himself kills that myth in court in 2005. When Wade Robson was questioned about Michael's sexually explicit collection by Ron Zonan during the 2005 trial, Robson was genuinely surprised to hear Michael even owned anything like it and confirmed under oath that he had never seen any of it. The other witnesses expressed the same kind of surprise, not because it disturbed them, they just never saw it before. So if none of them ever saw those materials before, what kind of grooming was the prosecution talking about? Now we can finally put this chapter to rest.